Hi, I'm Ian Allison. I'm here with Sandra Rowe, and this is Enterprise Blockchain Isn't Dead. And for the next section, we're going to look at um, sustainability, supply chains, ESG, uh, environmental, social governance, all these things that are becoming so important right now with our next two guests. And, and that is uh, that they're Caroline Malcolm from the OECD, that August um, um, organization, uh, to talk about kind of the policy and the wherewithals of what what governments and companies are doing with blockchain in this area. And for some practical examples, we've got Doug Johnson from the startup Circular. So can I, I'll, I'll start with you, Caroline. Uh, maybe tell me what's what's cooking on the, on the ESG blockchain front, on the sustainable blockchain front at the OECD. Sure. Hi, Ian. Good to see you. And good to see you too, Sandra. Thanks very much for, for the invitation. It's very good to be here. The OECD has been doing a huge amount of work. Um, in this space, particularly um, looking at um, the role of blockchain in improving the sustainability of both uh, financing, but also the, the quality and of, of metrics in the in the ESG space, um, but also looking at sort of. Uh, Blockchain ecosystems more, more broadly, we have, um, to give you a couple of examples uh, in this space, we've put out a recent report looking at the role that the technology can play in improving um, sustainable infrastructure investments. So talking about large scale infrastructure projects there. But at the same time, we also have some non-sector specific but country specific studies looking, for example, at um, adoption of the technology, particularly amongst small to medium enterprises and how governments can actually support those efforts uh, in, in a way which, you know, allows innovation but also mitigates any downside risks from, from those. So it's a, it's a very exciting space, um, particularly on the, this ESG supply chain uh, side of things. It's, it's a really hot space. Uh, and, um, you know, if I just turn to Doug uh, for a moment, I was I was over in Phoenix at the the Hyperledger conference, only one of the last conferences when you could still go to a conference, uh, right? And um, when when we chatted, Doug, I was really, I mean, it's, I was quite blown away by. I mean, you must be the busiest guy in blockchain. You know, working with Volvo and Boeing, and I, I don't. I mean, I don't want to announce companies that out of turn. But listen, just, do you want to just tell us what you're doing with these supply chains and how you're tracking and tracing what goes on in them? It's fascinating. Yeah, thank, and thank you very much for, for inviting me to join you here on this conversation. Um, <clears throat> we, we've been going about three years with a, with a laser focus on um, responsible sourcing and uh, CO2 tracking in industrial supply mm -hmm. chains. Um, think of, think a, mo a moment about um, you know our collective societal desire to to move towards things like electric vehicles. Well, they rely on batteries. Batteries rely on raw materials like cobalt that come with significant human rights concerns. Um, many of you may know that that cobalt, um, you know, sixty percent of the world's cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and and that you know a war-torn area, uh, and also all sorts of challenges around, for example, uh, child labor. And clearly, these are things which, you know, none of us as consumers want to uh, be responsible for um, the exploitation of the planet and some of the poorest people on the planet. And of course, you know, car manufacturers, for example, are very keen to try and demonstrate that they are sourcing responsibly, um, as well as, for example, um, you know, measuring the, the carbon footprint of their supply chain in the manufacturer of something like an electric car. Um, you know, we're swapping the the, the tailpipe emissions uh, for the emissions of the supply chain in moving to to electric vehicles, and it's those problems that we've been working on. The complexity, of course, is that you know what you dig out of the ground is nothing like a car, and so you have to be able to track a commodity through the the, the processes of refining and manufacture through multiple participants, ranging from you know small scale miners in in Africa potentially all the way through the industrial supply chain through multiple countries in you know uh, Asia for example until you get to a car manufacturer say in in in, in Germany um, and so um, it lends itself naturally to a distributed ledger solution but of itself blockchain doesn't solve that problem and I, I echo the point that was made by Adam from Salesforce it's about a fusion of technologies to achieve a business solution I, it's great stuff. I, you know what really surprised me was when you told me that uh, the creating a, a Tesla battery, a, an electric car battery, has a bigger carbon footprint than than driving a petrol car around for fifty thousand miles because of the way it's produced. 
Yeah, and I mean, this isn't knocking Tesla. This is all electric vehicles. There is a huge mm. challenge at the moment with making sure that we reduce the uh, the carbon footprint of the manufacturer of the electric vehicle. Um, and the single largest contributor to that carbon footprint is the battery. Um, and so the work that we've been doing with Daimler, uh, for example, um, has been to, uh, because supply chains, of course, are dynamic, the flow of materials is dynamic through the supply chain. What we've been doing is attributing uh, a, a slice of the carbon from the different participants along the supply chain um, to the eventual you know battery that that, that goes into the car um, and, and and that's something that that's potentially interesting to a whole variety of you know manufacturers not just in the auto industry I mean the same challenges apply to aerospace that is dealing with you know exactly the same thing around reducing its carbon impact uh, and of course consumer electronics and a whole variety of other industries um, and in the current covid crisis of course suddenly we're all interested in the resilience of our supply chains that starts with with you know, a degree of transparency while maintaining an appropriate set of commercial co confidential relationships between buyers and suppliers, but a degree of transparency in order to understand what's going on tier three, four, five of the supply chain. So, hi, um, I'm going to jump in here because I think, um, you're, Doug, you're raising some excellent points about um, the lack of just data um, transparency around where the component parts are from A to B to C. And that's a very difficult thing when you've got glo complex global supply chains. So the question I have for both of you in a post COVID-19 world, and you hear this rhetoric happening now pretty much in every country, but particularly in the US, you're hearing this. They want to bring back, you know, their supply chains. Um, they're going to build everything at home. But the reality is, is these commodities sit in very specific places in the world. So how do you see the post COVID-19 world and global supply chains? And then, you know, obviously what's the blockchain role in that? Um, yeah. Uh, who do you want to go first? Go ahead, Caroline. Sure, sure, go. thanks, Sandra. Um, look, I think, uh, I think you make a very good point and it, it certainly brought a lot of attention. I think people were almost shocked um, at the sort of lack of transparency when they really understood that, you know, there are a lot of cases where we didn't necessarily understand where everything was in, in, in a supply chain at any given time. Um, and I think that was something that people have perhaps had, had taken for granted and, and this, this crisis really revealed that, in fact, that that wasn't really the case. But it's obviously an enormous opportunity for, for this technology to actually improve uh, improve those systems and provide greater transparency, not just, you know, at individual points in the supply chain, but to, to the system uh, as a whole. But I think that, that Doug's brought up a, a good point in terms of, you know, how feasible is that? Like how far away are we actually from, from getting to that system? And really what we've seen in the work that the OECD has been doing, which is looking at the, the, these systems as a whole and then trying to consider the policy implications, is that we really see that, that some of the challenges to implementing these systems come not just from, from the technology. And so that's the point again, is that the blockchain doesn't sit alone. It sits in a broader system of other technologies, but also in, in a broader environment where you may not necessarily have the, the right elements in place. And certainly when it comes to uh, issues of not just um, quantitative, you know, can you get sort of 10 widgets from, from A to B, but also assessing more qualitative aspects of supply chain, so due diligence around whether you are using, you know, child labour, slave labour, working conditions and so forth. It's certainly a much more, more difficult area of the space. So where we see actually beginning to develop is some of these niche areas like Cobalt that, that Doug's using um, uh, in, in, in some of their systems um, and actually seeing that being the starting point rather than sort of suddenly the whole, the whole ecosystem moving on to, to a system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything that, that, um, that Caroline just said. I, I would draw a distinction between the primary supply of a material, you know, which is obviously located somewhere in the ground, wherever it happens to be, and the right. secondary supply, the circular economy. Um, you know, the, the when you think about the recycling of batteries, I mean, how many of us have got old lithium ion batteries in our in our old Blackberries sitting on a kitchen drawer? The reality is there's a considerable amount of this stuff out there already that, that we need to get a little bit more intelligent about recycling. We could be talking about plastic waste. The technology backbone to underpin extended producer responsibility for the circular economy is as important as the first use of these raw materials. And, of, uh, and, and, and when you're talking about 
incredible asymmetry in distributed players. There is no one who could host um, a single, you know, monolithic solution that would be the information system. It it has to be a distributed ledger. So so interesting. I, and I mean, you you touched on what I was going to say next, Doug. And it's this idea that it's not it's supply chains, but it's also about recycling and. You started off with with batteries, which is a use case that, that that quite a few people have looked at. I think IBM as well, and 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 I know Everledger are doing that too. Um, but but then you realised it just opened up this vista uh, of, of of possibilities, and you, you're looking at plastics recycling. And and after I chatted with you, I, I dived in and had a look and looked at the recycling technologies that company in in the UK. And and what, the way we recycle stuff just now is really dumb. But there but there is there are chemical processes you can use that are um, considerably more sophisticated. And 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 blockchain plays a part because you can prove that you're doing this in 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 a really sensible way. I mean, dive in a little bit to this plastic recycling. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, the the majority of plastic recycling, when we all as consumers put stuff into our bins at home, for example, it goes off to a multifunctional recycling facility that's sorting waste. And and the majority of that plastic is then um, uh, what's called mechanically recycled. And, and, And because it's mixed plastic, you know, your bleach bottles with your Coke bottles, you can't reuse it for food grade, uh, food grade plastic in second use. And so it ends up being put into mixed bales, which become construction materials. And while that's a sensible use of plastic, we're missing a real opportunity. And uh, uh, hence the birth of the chemical recycling industry, which means that waste plastic is is turned into something called pyrolysis oil, um, effectively a form of crude oil that is recreated from plastic, which is sent to the same refineries uh, run by the oil majors to turn it back into all of the things that were initially created from crude oil. Um, and, and, and that is the future of recycling because it means that um, that waste plastic can be turned back into Coke bottles and and into wax and into fuel and all of the other things that that you would want as derivatives um, uh, from, from from that. So the challenge, of course, at the moment is that none of us are set up to recycle at sufficient scale to create a steady flow of that raw material back into that you know recycling operation. Although there's lots of people looking at this, but it needs a technology backbone to underpin it. So you know, all of us as consumers as well should should you know should should start becoming more demanding of how our plastic is recycled. The um, topics that we're talking about today are um, really huge um, scaling issues as well. If we think about, it's not just the technology, it's around getting cultural and mindset shifts. Uh, do you guys think that this requires a multi-stakeholder approach, meaning we need government involved, we need the consumer, we need the enterprises, we need the entrepreneurs? Um, how do you look at how we actually go about solving this pro- these problems? Yeah. Carol, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure, Doug, thanks. Um, yeah, look, I, Sandra, I think absolutely, I mean, multi-stakeholder approach is absolutely critical. I mean, it, we've, it's something we've really tried to embed in the work that we do here at, at the OECD. Um, I guess there's a, a, a couple of important points there. Um, one is around education. Um, you know, our focus is obviously on, on policymakers and really creating a, a global reference point for policymakers on, on this technology. A huge component of the work that we're doing at the OECD is around education. So speaking to, to government officials, to, to ministers, um, to ambassadors, to really help them understand what the technology is and its potentials, obviously also some of the risks that, that it entails, um, but helping them understand what they need to understand as, as people who are kind of shaping the, the environment. But obviously it goes beyond just, just government, as, as you've said, to other stakeholder groups. But I also want to pick up something that Doug just mentioned, which is sort of the, the need, you know, the opportunity that blockchain offers to some of these nuances in, in, in supply chains. But at the same time, I think there's a flip side to that, which is around around the fact that we are seeing these sort of kind of niche uh, developments and in particular supply chains being uh, being developed. But 
to really make the ecosystem work, we I think very much from the outset we need to be thinking about interoperability. And that's why, you know, it's one of the things we are really passionate about at, at the OECD is, is promoting interoperability. And obviously that can happen at, at different levels of sort of different layers, whether it sort of be the sort of baseline protocol layer up to the application layer. But ensuring there is an efficient um, capacity for interoperability, I think is going to be really, really critical and, and is part of, of the kind of what I see is, is the need for sort of a global guidance um, on a sort of a coherent approach to some of these developments in the industry, whether it be around compliance, digital security, transparency, and as I said, interoperability. Yeah, completely agree. Um, uh, Ian has already reported on the work that we're, uh, we're doing with Everledger at the moment around interoperability. Both Everledger and us um, uh, work on the Oracle platform and, and we're in a sort of three-way project with Oracle at the moment working on interoperability as a way of trying to define a series of standards, certainly for the battery supply chain, um, which, um, you know, is a start. Uh, everything has to start somewhere, but, it, you know, it's inconceivable that an entire industry will will adopt a single solution. And so it's important that, you know, end customers have the ability to to join, um, you know, a credible platform and be confident that, that material can exist on different platforms as long as it can't be double counted. Um, so I completely echo that. I think regulators, government have an important role in, you know, signposting direction, for example, like the, around the circular economy and the importance of things like, you know, demonstrating, you know, ESG or, or extended producer responsibility. Uh, and then it's for, you know, industry to, to work together at speed to try and uh, create solutions. And, you know, there's a lot of talk amongst some of these other uh, some some of these other uh, sessions that have been run on CoinDesk TV over the last day or so about you know consortia, um, you know there's an alternative approach which is which is more of a coalition where you know participants don't have to enter into formal legal consortia in order to work together, um, and and that slightly looser approach I think will remove one of the barriers to adoption. Um, you don't necessarily um, need everybody to join a formal consortium, and and that's the approach that we've taken. Mm. Fantastic stuff. I think for my money, the most compelling use case for blockchain right there um, is, is this sustainability stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm completely converted. So listen, I just want to say thanks to you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot, Sandra. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.